All right, so veering dramatically from uh, medical technologies and, and life and death topics, uh, I've changed the name of my talk. Um, it's now, not succinctly, a hypothetical Section 4 report on how a spy took on Donald Trump 30 years ago, won the battle, and lost the war. A comic tragedy in four acts. You see, I was a co-founder of SPY in 1986. And I was invited to speak here because SPY was a pioneer in information design, particularly as it was used for satirical and dramatic effect. The design was dense, cluttered, multi-layered. My co-founder, Kurt Anderson, likes to refer to it as hypertext before the internet. And now I'm starting a new company called Section 4, which, when it launches later this year, will once again uh, try to be a pioneer in visual language in its delivery of business insights to professionals. So how to tie these two experiences together? Uh, how to harken back 30 years, like we did with the 25th anniversary of Spy, which was published when we were three years old in 1989. Um, seemed like a good opportunity to do a section four story that is a visual, highly opinionated, designed to provoke as much as to inform story about a particularly timely and relevant vein of spies inquiry and truth telling from the late 80s. So I don't know about you, but the presidential election of 2016 has left me traumatized, which is to say I'm angry, I'm upset, and I'm utterly confused. You see, Donald Trump met his match back in 1990. He was done. He spent that year and the next liquidating real estate, uh, cruise ships, gold logoed buildings, and moving rapidly toward bankruptcy. And although new evidence suggests that his own boneheaded business dealings were his downfall, at our little satirical magazine, Spy, we really thought we were responsible. We thought we had brought down the high class, swanky real estate mogul, the Queens born casino operator, the short-fingered Bulgarian and Upper West Side Ravager. We succeeded in our mission because we were relentless in our research, we were fearless in our truth-telling, and we called them lots of very clever and very unflattering names that always got under his skin. Epithets like joyless punk millionaire and Foundering casino operator and scalp titan self promoter, and of course, short fingered Bulgarian. So let's look at the data. When Spy launched in 1986, Trump was just starting his ascent as a public figure. Our debut issue cast him as our number one jerk, a hustler on his best behavior. That year, per the New York Times, and this is my data foundation, he lost $69 million, 1986, up from $46 million the year before. Now, the red line is losses. And remember, those increments on the left in, uh, scale are $50 million. This is, these are big numbers. And the purple bars are mentions in SPY. I'll get to that. As Spy made him regular fodder in 1987 with his first cover appearance and, uh, and a third place finish in our list of the most annoying, alarming, and appalling people, he gained public exposure and clout. He started a gambit as a green mailer, and it was successful for a while. He was trading on his newfound fame. He would buy into a company. The stock would go up, and he'd sell out. And 
that allowed him to reduce his losses in 87 and again in 88, uh, cut to 42 million and then down to 30 million in 1988. The mentions in SPY, again, the purple bars go from 6 to 15 to 47 in 88. So while we're helping making him famous, he's trading on that fame to make some money? No, make a little money to offset the losses. And then, as you can see, the shit hit the fan. And the losses skyrocketed. Let me go back on that. So you see the losses go haywire. But before that reversal of fortune, let's explore the political ambitions, act two, of the super glamorous Queensborn boss as chronicled by his number one adversary, Spy. In September 1987, we listed the casino operating hustler as a contender for Ed, to replace Ed Koch as mayor. The following month, we listed him among his misdeeds that he didn't promise he would never run for office. One month later, we published a paragraph that we've grown to regret. This is November of, uh, of 88, of 87, sorry. We teased him and mocked his qualifications for president, citing a campaign kickoff speech he gave in New Hampshire a year before the 88th election. And it ended with a line, please God, let him run. If Donald Trump runs for president, God, we promise we will never make fun of the Pope again, or Pat Robertson. Well, the Pope anyway. And there it is, Trump for president. 29 years before the nightmare that we can't seem to wake up from, we even anticipated the Russian thugs in his inner circle. And we did a poll that suggested that the 25 to 40 cohort, the same cohort, the 55 plus cohort, that rallied behind him 30 years later, was disappointed to not have him in the race. We reported his personal guarantee that if he did run, he would win. Crazy. But we weren't serious, right? Even the Donald brushed, aside the, uh, brushed off the prospects of actually running for president. As we reported in 1988, the Queensborne casino operator dismissed his presidential aspirations by saying, look, would you run for office if you paid almost no taxes last year? Well, we've seen where that goes. In the frenzy of that election year, he continued to claim that everybody wants me to do it. But 1988 came and went. And in 1989, we, we kept featuring his famously short fingers, picturing him with doppelganger mass murderers, and once his, mar his first marriage dissolved, imagine his super swanky social life. But we were watching all the time his flirtation with politics, raising the hypothetical that if xenophobe Trump becomes president and chronicling his contributions to Rudy Giuliani, and once again citing his connections to Moscow, then, as I said, the shit hit the fan. We always figured it was him or us. There's pretty good evidence that he felt the same. Act three. In September 1988, he told his favorite gossip columnist, Liz Smith, that Spy was failing and would not be around in a year. So for the next 12 months, we ran a monthly feature counting down the days to our demise. Every month, another 30 days would come off the calendar until in October 1989, we turned the tables by celebrating our survival and beginning a new feature called Death Be Not Short Fingered, a countdown based on the life expectancy of a 43-year-old cockroach, uh, I mean white male. 11,579 days to go. That would take him to May of 2021. Hmm. And speaking of the tide turning, turning the mentions, the, uh, the purple bars, 
in SPY just kept accelerating to 81 in 1989, 95 in 1990. And now, instead of inadvertently adding to his riches, the SPY attention seemed to be having the desired effect. The green mail gig was up. The markets threw, saw, saw through his bluster. He was faking all the time. And he never followed through. And so there was no offset to his real estate blunderings. And he lost $182 million in 1989, $207 million in 1990, and more in 1991. Roughly 1% of all losses by US taxpayers those years, more than any other individual taxpayer. We'd done it. Act four, vanquish the short-fingered one, the debtor adulterer, the long-running scamp, the plucky boar, Trump's final days indeed. Which is not even to capture the feuds. Ah, the feuds. Lots of letters and bluster and threatened lawsuits and unflattering mentions in the spy list. This one was referred to by Marco Rubio in one of the primary debates. But I've run out of time, so those stories will have to wait for another day, a better day we can all hope. Thank you.